Hello, and welcome to the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast, where you'll hear conversations that generate one aha moment after another for you. There is an enormous wave of goodness and progress well underway in the world, and it is still an amazing place, this world of ours. No matter what the news and social media are telling us, there are the most amazing um, social innovators out there tackling the hardest problems in our world, and most of them still think the future is bright. So we need to know what they know, what they see as possible. We need to know how they get around obstacles and see opportunity and setbacks. And they live with a burning sense of excitement about all that's possible. I want that. I live that way now, and I want you to live that way too. So hello, my name is Dr. Linda Ulrich, and I'm the founder of The Goodness Exchange, a place that's now the home for goodness on the internet. There we have articles and podcasts and um, other interviews, videos, courses, where you can learn about all the good in the world and find your way into being a part of it. And today on the podcast, we are going to interview just somebody that I've known for quite some time, and neither of us knew that we'd ever be here together. We met at a at a conference, a, a goodness and ideas conference called Pop Tech years ago, mm -hmm. and Roshan and I spent a, the most amazing, nice little lunch together one day, never dreaming our paths would cross in this this whole new way. But Roshan Paul is an author of a great book that I've been working on right here. I'm going to show it many, many times because I think you'll love it. It's called the New Reason to Work book, How to Build a Career That Will Change the World. Now, that's a title, isn't it? Like, that's what I aspire to. And, I, and, you know, we all have the ability to change the world in some small way for some others, whether that's one person or millions. So, Roshan, welcome to the Goodness Exchange, and thank you uh, for joining the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast and helping us understand all that's possible today. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Linda. I am delighted to be here. I've you know, been a big fan of your work ever since we met. I just love the framing Conspiracy of Goodness, uh, so it's an honor to be here. Uh, we, when, when, when I got introduced to that conspiracy of goodness concept, it's a story actually from World War II, um, I, I just had one of those goosebump moments head to toe and I knew we needed a podcast named that phrase <laughs> <laughs> in all the chaos. Excellent. <laughs> so, so Roshan, um, we tell uh, uh, we have articles and podcasts and all this going on at the Goodness Exchange that introduce people to the lives of others who have found their way through this arc of going from an ordinary person who knew they had something uniquely, um, they had something unique to to contribute to the world. Going from that ordinary person scratching their head, wondering what how, how this all comes about. Do, do I have to join an ashram and commit all my worldly goods <laughs> to, <laughs> to the wind? Or, but um, your story is so so lovely in that you're you're going from ordinary person to somebody who's changing the lives of others. Um, includes this whole <laughs> adventure that you actually teach people how to make that journey. So tell, give us a give us a, the highlights of your journey from ordinary person to to where you find yourself today. Absolutely, I'm happy to do that. So I grew up very much an ordinary person, uh, middle class background, uh, upbringing in India, and um, I came to the United States for my uh, university for undergrad. And uh, like most foreign students in the US, I was looking at going to work in investment banking or management consulting when I graduated. Uh, and then I was in my senior year of college and uh, came out of my French class one morning and uh, went to the caf cafeteria to get a cup of coffee. And I saw a group of people clustered around a TV screen. And that seemed a bit unusual for my particular very nerdy university um, to see people watching TV at nine o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday. So I walked over to see what was going on. And that's when I saw the, the second plane hit the second of the Twin Towers. 
Uh, and, you know, saw what happened, the buildings collapsed, people jumping out of them and, you know, falling to the ground. And, um, and that's when I knew that my life was going to be different after that. And so, um, you know, 9-11 was followed uh, in the U.S. with, of course, uh, a lot of racial attacks on people with brown skin. Uh, it was followed by the U.S. starting to invade Afghanistan and then Iraq. Um, and at the same time, back in my home country of India, there was also a lot of violence of terrorist attacks. Um, there was ethnic uh, rioting um, that led to a lot of death. And it, to me, it seemed that as I was graduating, uh, the two countries I knew best were seemed to be on fire. And um, what good would then I do going to go help an in insurance company or an oil company become more profitable? So I, I felt at that point that, you know, um, I, I shouldn't go that way. And I decided to return to India and start working in nonprofits and social entrepreneurship. So that it was 2002, it was a recession. Um, you know, I was turning down a prestigious opportunity uh, to move back to India, work in a nonprofit. And, you know, everyone thought I was nuts. Like who, who does something like that? Um, but then I built a career in social entrepreneurship, um, got to eventually travel around the world, uh, you know, give talks at, at universities and so on. Uh, and so about 10 years in, the same people who thought I was nuts were now asking me, hey, how did you build that global career and social impact? You know, I'd like to do that. I'm kind of bored in my corporate job. I uh, don't feel any sense of passion or fulfillment. You know, how do I have that kind of career? And I felt that, you know, this was a group of people that was going to be increasing in number. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, along with a woman I met at the same organization who had a very different story than me, but, uh, but had come to similar questions, we decided to quit our jobs and start a new organization called the Mani Institute that helps people to make that transition uh, towards careers in social impact. Um, and uh, so we started an organization, we left our jobs in the US and moved to Africa actually to get started over there. And uh, we didn't even have a sense at that point of just how much we were on the cusp of a huge movement of people looking to, to build impactful and meaningful careers, to join the conspiracy of goodness, if you will. Um, and, that, and that just grew so much in the decade that we were working on Amani Institute. So I think we, we had good timing there. Um, and so that's, that's a bit of the, the journey of going from being a uh, supporting all these incredible change makers and social entrepreneurs to becoming one uh, and then helping lots of other people as well. So when I listen to your story, I just have to nail down a few things in our listeners' minds that this, uh, a lot of people are hearing right now about the great resignation That's right. or the great reset. And, you know, the first time I heard those two terms, um, I, I remember thinking, I think it's the great questioning. I think lots and lots of people have this nagging feeling that, yeah. that they're not doing what they are uniquely built to contribute. Mm -hmm. For instance, I had, a, <laughs> I had an amazing professional career. I was a dentist for 30 years and I was fixing teeth with computers mm -hmm. in 2003. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, by anyone's standards, yeah, I was doing time, what yeah. I was uniquely yeah. built to contribute mm -hmm. um and and had a successful happy life my husband's also a dentist so we had a nice business together and our and that by everyone's definition is as good as it gets but i had this nagging feeling that there was something else yeah. and um and that started a long time ago this 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 what do you think about the date what are the dates when you started to see there was a calling for what you were wanting to do what were those dates by year um, for me, you know, uh, it was 2001, it was September uh, 2001, uh, and then that whole year, you know, like 2001, 2002, my senior year of college, as I was trying to going to go into the, the workforce and had no idea what I was going to do, and felt I was pursuing a traditional route and then felt a calling to go in a completely different direction. So, do you think out in society, though, that, that you were, uh, okay, many people's lives were changed by 9-11. I, I really ended the cart on my life around then but when do you see because i always talk about the con conspiracy of goodness as yeah. being something that started probably 15 years ago mm -hmm. maybe as a response to 9 11 maybe mm -hmm. not but i just know that that there is so much goodwill and good things happening yeah. and there are some early adopters in that yeah. way that Absolutely. were doing incredible things and looking kind of out of step yeah absolutely i think 9 11 is a good um place to 
to start from, I think uh, 2008 and the global recession was another big one because uh, what that made a lot of people realize was that, you know, I, I could be, you know, um, working uh, like crazy, trying to build this career and make a lot of money. But if like banks that have been around for a hundred years can collapse, if entire countries, economies, can collapse overnight, then what am I doing all of this for if it can all go away? And so I think that was another moment where a lot of people lost faith in big institutions. You know, like we, we brought up, those of us who grew up, um, you know, in or had our formative years in the 20th uh, century, um, you know, we, we brought up to believe in, good, in big institutions. And I think um, the Great Recession kind of eroded trust in big institutions. And so then, so you saw the massive jump in startups, um, in interest in courses around social entrepreneurship, or even just entrepreneurship in universities. Um, you know, I don't know the numbers, but I would say like there's probably been a 2x or 3x increase in the number of courses in universities that have to do with social impact from 2008 to now. Uh, so I think that was another really key moment. And I just think it's it's kind of grown since then, um, and particularly the last five years, you know, um, have, have led to an even greater uh, surge. And I think the, my guess is too early to say, but that the global pandemic is also making a lot of people reevaluate what they want to be working um, uh, for, what they're working towards, uh, you know, who's essential, who's not, uh, things like that. Um, you said the great questioning, and, and I love that. And I would refine it even slightly further and say the great questing, uh, if you will. You know, it's like a, a quest that people are on for meaningful work. Um, and uh, and I think that leads to also a meaningful life uh, as well. Yeah, that's that's the uh, that's the ethos that I see. And my kids are all in their twenties, and um, boy, their generation does not want at all what my generation wanted. They want a life full of experiences. They don't want to be burdened by stuff. Um, they are. You know, I, I have a great story <laughs> to tell. I was walking out of the house over the holidays to go get a piece of plywood for a project. And I yelled at everyone because my whole entire family was home um, that I was going for a piece of plywood. And they said, and I said, I'm going for a piece of plywood. And they all shouted out, where are you going? And I was like, why do they care where I'm going? Yeah. And it was important to them that I went to a certain box store uh -huh. and not another. Yeah. Because they've got um, notions about one versus the other, who's doing the world a good mm -hmm. in a good way and who's not. Mm -hmm. And I think this, I mean, if 69% of consumers consider themselves values driven, yes. this leaves so much running room for the kind of new working world that you're talking about, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think this is just going to keep growing. And I give a lot of credit to your children's uh, generation, you know, and, and millennials in general uh, for starting to push uh, society, push companies uh, towards that in a much bigger way than before. So absolutely. I think that that's uh, we're on the cusp of, of that, or I hope at least, you know, we're on the cusp of a much bigger push towards um, social impact baked into, you know, everyone's jobs, everyone's work. And that's one of the the core pieces of our book is really, you know, with the hypothesis that in the future, all work is going to be impact driven, is going to be impact first work. We need it to be the case. If you look at what's happening with climate change, if you look at, you know, the, the very sort of belated but welcome push towards diversity, equity and inclusion, all of these are really pushing society, pushing companies in a direction where we can all, you know, have a greater impact with our work. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I what you're talking about, you know, makes me have so much hope for the future. Um, and and it's going to take people like you and I and and so many others. Almost everyone we've interviewed in the last six weeks on the podcast yeah. have come at this exact topic from a new, cool way. Mm -hmm. That yes, there there could be this threat based mentality about the future, mm -hmm. but there could also be this this um, opportunity based mentality. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. That's a great way to put it, I think. Yeah, I mean, we get to choose. It's not an either or world. It's a both and, you know? Exactly. Okay, so let's let's get people into the subject of understanding um, what what your, uh, this perspective that you're offering. Because that's why I love um, authors like you, is that, you know, perspective is everything. 
Yeah, that's all I remember from one of the authors that I recently interviewed his, well, I remember a lot from that interview, but, and this guy's book, but I remember that we can either choose between a threat-based narrative mm-hmm. about the future, or we can look at it like, where's the opportunity here? It's our choice. Absolutely. So to start with, let's, let's start with this question. You know, you, you say in the book, or it's maybe even um, on the, on the back cover, do you want to make a difference? Do you, d- does the work you're doing matter? Um, do you want to have an impact? So these are, these are, start out by telling us what, a, what impact means. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're talking specifically about uh, careers of impact or impact first careers, as we put it in the book. And so impact first careers are careers where you spend a majority of your time trying to make a difference or solve a problem in society or to reduce suffering or you know whatever it may be so um it's not that it's uh it, you can't make money or you, you know that can't be a part of it but it's that your primary intention is not to increase your own bottom line or your company's bottom line but actually to solve a problem in society um and to um make a difference that way so so we define an impact first career as one where you are you know, spending the majority of your time in that uh, regard. Okay, and and um, and you can still put bread on the table. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I think there's still pro- some of us who think that it's an either or proposition there too. Either you're not going to make money, or you're and you're going to change the world, or you're going to go for broke on the on the finance side. But but uh, for instance, the the growth of the B Corp world. Mm-hmm. I interviewed an expert on B Corps just to get anybody who listens to this podcast yeah. to understand what a magical world that is becoming. Mm-hmm. Um, aside from nonprofits, there's this whole other burgeoning. Talk to me about about what you see exactly. happening. I think you're absolutely right that people have this dichotomy in their minds that you can either uh, do good or do well, and I think increasingly that that is breaking down in societies and most people aren't aware of that that's one of the other reasons we wrote this book because you know we work with uh, lots and lots of people who are trying to make that switch into an impact first career let's say they were doing something that they um, previously that they didn't uh, feel as much passion for and they want to do something that contributes to society one of their big questions is how will I make a living doing that and when they came to work with us and do our programs at Amani Institute they realized that, whoa, there's a huge uh, world of options out here that I didn't know about. You know, you mentioned B Corps. Uh, the B Corps movement is, is wonderful. It's part of a larger movement that we call conscious capitalism in the book. So, um, you know, that's like for-profit companies that are trying to do well uh, and also do good and make, make a difference. But the range of options is, is even broader than that. So there's even within the Um, the social impacts uh, space, there's uh, consulting firms, you know, all of the big um, uh, consulting firms that we know about, the McKinsey's and Deloitte's of the world have a social impact practice now. And um, most, uh, there's loads and loads of other consulting firms that pay well, give you access to a global lifestyle and travel and so on, but they primarily work with social impact. That's one set. Um, On the finance side, there's impact investors and uh, philanthropists uh, who create foundations which need staff um, that also are, you know, pay pretty well and so on. If you work at the UN or the World Bank, you make a pretty good salary that is tax free. So, you know, you can also then uh, make quite a bit of money that way. There are lots of intermediaries. So so these are research firms or training firms that also, you know, do, do pretty well. So most people aren't aware, you know, that it's way beyond the traditional NGO or nonprofit. uh, And there's loads of other, so these opportunities as well. And I've just like mentioned a few. So I think that as people understand this more and more, we'll see more interest in this area and starting to break down that false dichotomy between uh, doing well and doing good. Yeah, that that's where it's all at. We can have we can we can do best. Okay, so um, one of the one of the great places where you really sharpened my mind about what you're talking about here is page 10, 11, 12, or 9, 10, 11. And you lay out how work is changing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, talk to us about that. Like, like what what are I mean, I know you just gave us a bunch of examples of what's available for work that either didn't exist or we didn't know about years ago. But what's the mentality about work? How's that changing? Absolutely. So 
we are talking about how the meaning of work, why we go to work at all is changing. So, um, you know, we, we started off in a world where work was about uh, purely getting our basic needs met, you know, food, shelter, uh, things like that. And uh, then we moved into a world with the Industrial Revolution and after where work became um, a source of prestige, a source of um, identity and self-worth. Uh, and, you know, those were some of the things we worked for. We measured our progress, um, you know, not by who brought home the most food, but by, you know, our a position on the corporate hierarchy around the amount of money uh, that uh, we bring home at the end of every month and so on. And that was probably the last 200 or so years. And uh, now we believe that the, 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 the meaning of work or the reason people go to work is slowly starting to shift towards actually making an impact in the world and that more and more people don't want their careers um, to only be defined by making money and, and covering their basic needs, but also achieving their potential, achieving um, their ability to give back to the world and contribute. And, you know, I think probably my parents' generation and others felt that, well, let's have this life where we work really hard and we provide for our family. And then when we retire, we can give back to society and community. And I think that uh, present generations are, are turning that on its head and say, and saying, I don't want to wait till I'm retired, dude. I want to do it from the get-go, you know? And, uh, uh, and so that's what we're seeing a big shift towards is people wanting to do that from the get-go. And the world of work changing to accommodate that, to accommodate that desire from people. And that's why the range of options and social impact that you know, existed say 50 years ago, it's, it's dramatic exponentially increased to, to all of the options that I was talking about. So people are, are redefining what work is about, what it should be about. And we see that that trend is gonna continue uh, down the road. It seems like people too, um, with the pandemic, uh, I was talking to a great thought leader um, in a podcast of August, September, when things were looking like they might taper off for us all. Mm -hmm. He was in England and um, he is he has a, a really cool way that he um, places lawyers <laughs> and uh, all over England. He has mm -hmm. the biggest business in England for place lawyer placing attorneys, which sounds kind of boring for our podcast, but it wasn't <laughs> is the funniest guy ever. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Um, and he tells these great stories, story after story, which I, which I want you to get into in a minute, mm -hmm. telling us the stories of people. But first, I have to ask you about something he said once to me. He said, what the pandemic has done in the legal world, at least, and he thinks in the wider world, is it's given us all the time to be home when our kids get off the bus. Mm -hmm. And we found that we want to be there to meet our kids at the bus. Yes. So now he sees the whole legal world in England turning back on and mm -hmm. bosses demanding that people are there eight to five again or eight to seven or eight to nine. Mm -hmm. And people are, and, and these young lawyers are saying, no, I, I want, you know, and then there's this pull because the boss wants people there when they need them right now mm -hmm. i've got this yeah. idea i need someone yeah. in the office so tell me about this 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 push and pull between management and workers and and how we can all improve that that work life the the classic word work-life balance yeah i think that um in some ways i would say it's a little too early to say because we're still in the pandemic and uh you know i i think it has opened up uh, the question for a lot of people as to how much time they want to spend in an office and whether they want to work from home. And a lot of companies and, and organizations are saying that we don't need to be in an office. You know, in fact, why spend all that money on a physical place? Um, that said, there'll be some jobs, some companies that that need to be in a place, that want to be in a place. Um, there are some people that prefer to be in an office and there are some people who prefer to work from home. And so I think this will all still shake out, right? The pandemic isn't over by any means as we're seeing. So, so this will all still shake out. And, and I think there'll be a move back to offices at some point, but not in the same way as before. Uh, and of course, the technology is going to keep improving to allow us to, to work in different ways, whether virtually or not. So I, I still think that there's like a part of that story still to be written. That so, said, I, yeah. Go ahead. Now, I was just going to say, I think that the larger conversation between employers 
and uh, their teams around, you know, what the meaning of work is all about and what we're here to do, how we're going to do it, how do we take care of each other, how do we take care of our teams, what are our values, what do we stand for uh, as a company, as a team. These questions, I think, you know, they were starting to be uh, raised uh, a lot before the pandemic, but I think they've just been much further unleashed in the pandemic. And I think the question of whether we'll work from home or not is less interesting to me as the question of uh, how will we show up? Like, what are we going to do as an organization? And I think that's being negotiated very much uh, as well between employers and their staff. And I'm assuming um, that uh, that it's going to raise uh, it's going to raise the bar on how employers um, position without greenwashing um, the impact of the work we're, we're engaged in, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, people are clever. They're not going to accept gr greenwashing, and they're <laughs> you're going to have your company's going to have to walk the talk, really, when push comes to shove. So, okay, so this could all get better and better as time goes on, and I think that you're saying it's gonna. <laughs> I, I am. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, tell me some stories. Tell me a few stories of people from that world that that you have seen you know, come from one place and wind up another? Because these these are the stories we need to hear to get us up out of bed and have us put one foot in front of the other towards our own mm -hmm. dream. Gosh, there are so many stories. Um, I will, let me tell you one story that's just coming to my mind right now. Um, this is a friend of mine who uh, was ha working in healthcare and uh, she, you know, had a lot of respect for the CEO of her company and it's a major a healthcare company in the United States. And um, she is very creative uh, and has a lot of chutzpah. And so she uh, wrote to the company's CEO saying, uh, I would like to learn from you. So can I, um, you know, meet you? And, you know, he gave her about 15 minutes. So, so she met him. You know, he's in his 50s or 60s. She's early 20s. Uh, so she meets with him. And at the end of that, she proposes to him that uh, he write a book that he's got so much wisdom to share and so on that uh, he write a book about that and she would write it for him. So like, he doesn't have to do anything. She'll interview him and write everything and they can write a book together. And, uh, you know, it's a very creative uh, thought, but it's also a way for her to basically get mentored by a very senior person from a young age. So they get to know each other well, they write this book. And then um, it's her birthday, I think, I don't remember, 25 or 26th birthday. And, um, um, he and she wants to do something, raise money for a cause that she cares about. And uh, he tells her that, you know, I'll match whatever you raise. Uh, and so she, um, you know, sends out an email to her entire email list uh, and saying, I'm raising money to support leaders in social impact. You know, please donate for my birthday, donate whatever you can. And I think one thing leads to another and she uh, gets a random phone call uh, from someone asking to meet her for coffee and she doesn't know this person never heard of him so she like chooses you know we'll meet in a very public uh, place for coffee and at that coffee he basically says i'm so inspired by what you're doing and he writes out a check for a million dollars uh to her and so she goes back to her and she's flabbergasted and she goes back to her uh, ceo and said um look what you did you know, gives him that check and says, you said you'll match this. So he reaches into um, his drawer, pulls out his checkbook and writes a check for a million dollars as well. So uh, so suddenly the two of them, now they have $2 million. And so uh, my friend leaves the healthcare company to start a, a, a nonprofit um, with the CEO as her co-founder uh, that was going to be dedicated to supporting other leaders working in social change. And that was about, I don't know, 10 years or so ago. That organization has now grown and supported hundreds of leaders around the world. They've also started an impact investing firm uh, and they're doing lots of other cool things. So that's just one story of, you know, a regular person. I suppose one could look at her and say there's nothing regular about her, right? But she comes from a, a regular background and, you know, with a little bit of inspiration and imagination nation uh, was able to do something truly tremendous you know so that's that's one story um, I'm picking American stories for now but uh, 
Another one is, um, you know, a friend of mine who is uh, a doctor and, um, you know, was in medical school. And um, when he graduated, he went to one of the top, um, you know, residency programs in the country. And after that, you know, he had his choice of going to work anywhere uh, in any hospital. Uh, and he decided to actually move to Virginia, Northern Virginia, and work in a healthcare clinic that was, you know, for primarily treating uh, people who are disadvantaged um, and minorities and people of color and so on. Uh, and today he is the, you know, he grew to pretty quickly to be the, the director, the CEO of that clinic. And actually in the pandemic, they were doing such an impressive job that Joe Biden stopped by and made that that clinic you know, to be a, a case that they wanted to highlight. So he got to meet the president and, uh, and so on. And this was just someone who, you know, had the world at his feet and, and could have done anything but chose to use his talent to give back uh, to society, um, you know. And so, so those are just, those are two stories, but I probably have dozens or uh, well, hundreds. And it, as you think of them through the rest of our interview, please share because stories um, have the power to transform lives. If we just mm -hmm. remember one person who had the courage to take that one step, it gives us the kind of um, fortitude that we may need just in that moment. Stories are so powerful. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna take a break and we come back. I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna have you share this wonderful insight from the book. You've got, um, is it six? Six, oh, the six, um, how to become an, an, an innovator. Mm -hmm. I love this part of the book. Okay, you know, great. Most of us want to be, um, want to be relevant. Mm -hmm. it, if you, no matter where you work, you want to be relevant. You just want to, don't be in a number in a cubicle or, or just average this or average that. Most mm -hmm. of us want to be relevant in the lives of others. And I found this, the way you broke down um, how, to, how to be innovative just an amazing um, way of looking at whether you're a, a teacher or a or a nurse or you know somebody in my dental practice or a yeah. uh, dry cleaner okay so let's take a break and we'll talk about a bunch of other wonder that's in the world that people have access to and when we come back we'll talk about how to become an innovative thinker dr linda here if you are hoping the world is a lot better than what we see on the news and social media, and if you've been overwhelmed by the misery and negativity coming from the screens in your life, I've got a wonderful connection for you. What I've learned after almost a decade of curating the internet for insight and innovation is that there is an enormous wave of goodness and progress well underway in the world that almost no one knows about yet. And that's what led me to create this podcast. And then I co-founded the Goodness Exchange. The Goodness Exchange is an amazing place on the internet now where you can enjoy unlimited access to hundreds of articles that give you a more complete positive perspective about the state of the world. You can listen to exclusive bonus content from this podcast with our guests who are knee deep in solving some of the world's most vexing problems, and yet they still think the future is bright. We need to know what they know. And at the Goodness Exchange, you can explore a feed of exclusively good news and recommended other kinds of content created by the Goodness Exchange community. No one with good ideas and good intentions need feel alone again. You are right to hold out hope for humanity. Millions of people are out there creating a better world, and we have created a gathering place for all that wonder. Who knows what's possible now that there's a place on the internet created to bring out our best impulses and our collective genius. To explore the home for goodness on the internet, visit goodness-exchange.com backslash membership. Thanks. Okay, we're back. So now we want to turn our um, uh, Roshan's light on into helping us get some practical tips for becoming innovators in our own worlds. And, and I use that word, you know, I think it's sometimes helpful to be innovative in our own families. Mm -hmm. In a, you know, to be the to the idea person in our workplace, um, it, we don't have to be captains of industry to Absolutely. need an innovative way to think. So that's what I love about this this next half of our conversation. You've just got one practical thing after another after another, so we can be the idea people. Explain to me how you look at innovative thinking. 
we look at innovation as uh, the super skill that all of us can possess and uh, we can reframe it as creative problem solving. This is something that every employer sees as the most valuable thing in their employees, right? An employee who can solve problems as opposed to just coming up with why, why things won't work. Um, and so it's really important for that reason. It's really important uh, also because if we're going to solve the problems we have around us in society, we need to be able to come up with new ideas and new solutions for it. But unfortunately, most people tend to look at creativity as something you're born with or you're not. And uh, I don't believe that that's the case. I, I, you know, so in the book, we talk about creativity as a set of behavioral um, uh, behaviors and skills that anyone can learn, anyone can put to practice to become uh, a better innovator in, in society and or even in their family or even in their workplace. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, it's the way we're getting through this. Mm -hmm. Either we're, we're just stumbling along, reacting to the last emotional roller coaster presented to us <laughs> or we're becoming a little bit more innovative in our ways yeah. of reacting. So, okay, the first one's a perfect example of what, what you're talking about. Something that we can actually just do. It doesn't have anything to do with being creative or not. It's ask more questions. Mm -hmm. Talk to me exactly. about all So, uh, you know, our education systems train us to run to find answers, right? Um, and good innovators don't jump to the first conclusion that they, they come to. They, they're good at holding the question uh, living the question even, and um, seeing that the first the, even the first answer that comes up is not necessarily going to be the right answer. Um, and, and so it's important to keep asking questions to uncover different elements of a problem. So it's, you're right that it's something that anyone can do and it's something that hardly anybody does, um, you know, which is to, to ask more questions um you know and, and this i think is even if you're meeting someone for the first time asking more questions to find out what makes that person tick or if you're in any in any interaction at all i think that you know the more questions you ask um uh, the the better off you'll be or the more you'll understand um and do you ever notice that there's this tendency in many of us um i'm as guilty as anyone to like listen to say what you're going to say next rather yes. than listening to understand absolutely oh 100 that is that's the challenge right there right exactly. listening to understand rather than listening to where you can jump in and get your turn right. okay the, the second one is living the problem you you mentioned that in in this first one but talk to us about living the problem living the problem is all about uh, immersing yourself in to understand uh what uh you know what's going on in a particular situation so um and and the reason that that's important is because so often we come up with ideas or solutions that are not actually what's needed on the ground. So um, there's the famous case of, you know, the, the NGO who wanted to, to help uh, with sanitation uh, in a village and so built uh, toilets for people that didn't have toilets before. And then they went back a year later and they found that those toilets were, people were still uh, going to the bathroom outside uh, in the woods and the toilets, the toilets, the fancy toilets that were, that were constructed were being used to store grain or chickens or, you know, uh, whatever else uh, people want to use it for, but they were still using the toilet the way they always had, right? Because they hadn't designed with, they hadn't spent time in that community to understand how that community operates and how to design for that, right? So that's just one, one example. I think if you've lived a problem, if you've, if you've lived through what you're trying to fix, then you're by default in a, in a better position to solve it. And if you haven't lived through it, then spending some time uh, in that is, is really important. So one story we, we tell in the book from one of our first classes in Brazil, uh, when we were working there was that um, there was a group of, uh, you know, young people who wanted to build a solution for uh, pregnant uh women and uh, none of them were pregnant so what they did was they spent they they built a kind of prosthetic or just like they put cushions or something uh they like mimic the weight of a baby and they tied it to their stomachs and then spent a whole day like walking around the city taking the metro um you know going shopping and so on while being while have carrying that weight to try to understand 
what it might be like uh, to be a pregnant woman walking around the city. So, the, so they used the insights from that in the solution that they were developing, right? So that's just a very simple way in which you can, you can think about it. But uh, living the problem, uh, you know, is immersing yourself into what's going on so that you can understand it better. Yeah, um, you know, that that goes along with um, I do a talk about how people find their purpose. And mm -hmm. that goes along with the second way that very com very commonly people live, uh, find their purpose um, is that they have some very often tragic event that visits them. And then all of a sudden they know what it's like to whatever to experience yeah. this thing. And then they are called forever in their life to help others either avoid that thing or get through it or whatever. But that, that and that is a lovely way um, to look at how you can turn obviously mm -hmm. um, terrifying things into a positive, but yeah. Okay. So that's really important. And that, that helps us get around this going in and opposing solutions mm -hmm. on people without doing the work. Exactly. Right. Okay. The third one is reframing. Talk to us about reframing. Reframing is one of my favorite ones. So uh, reframing is basically how do you look at a situation and come up with uh, a reframe of it, a radically different way of looking at the same thing. Um, so I'll give you an example we use in the book. So I was part of a workshop once where uh, there was someone who was in the Ministry of uh, Tourism uh, of the Mauritius, of Mauritius, which, uh, you know, for those who don't know, is a small island in the Indian Ocean, just off the coast of Africa. And uh, they were trying to figure out how to improve Mauritius standing as a tourism destination. Uh, and so a reframe in that case is to not look at Mauritius as a small and significant island in the Indian Ocean, but to look at Mauritius as the largest ocean state in the world. Right. So so it's not then a small piece of land, but they're looking at the country as all the water between all the islands uh, and together that makes it a massive state, actually. Right. So 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 it's not a small and significant island. It's a it's a huge ocean state. That's one way to look at it. You know, another story we tell in the book is when uh, some of our students wanted to um, help uh, street children in uh, Kenya. They, they started off by asking, well, what can we do for these uh, street children, um, you know, who are poor, who are disadvantaged, uh, and uneducated, and so on. Uh, and they started off by asking that question. And that's a question that, you know, millions of people have asked before. Um, and then eventually, through, through the work of uh, the program that they were in, they reframed it to say not, what can we do for you, but what can you do for us, you know, and, and by unlocking by changing the frame they'd rather than look at all the things they need to give these young people these street children they looked at what skills do the street children already have that they can contribute to us in a way that allows them to earn money and pull themselves up out of poverty so they eventually designed um one thing street children know well is the streets um and so they um they designed a walking tour of downtown nairobi where tourists can experience Nairobi through the eyes of the street children, you know, and then that grew from, uh, you know, just an idea to what's it's today the number one uh, uh, trip advisor experience that you can have in um, uh, in Kenya, in Nairobi, right? So, so that really um, enabled that to grow dramatically. And it was a completely different way of looking at it. Uh, and uh, today, though, some of those street children that were leading those tours have moved out of the slum, have, you know, bought apartments in middle class neighborhoods and are role models for their community as well, right? So that's, those are just two ways of like, uh, how a reframe can help you come up with a different set of solutions. No, I can see that being very helpful. And for that matter, living the problem a little bit better um, in families that are having troubles struggling with the communication with their teenagers and stuff that that reframing, you have to get clever, but I'm sure it can be done. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So the third one is associating. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fourth one, fourth one is associating. Yeah. So associating is the simple act of um, taking ideas from one area and applying it to another, right? Um, so uh, giving an example from something that, uh, you know, we all, you know, have used. Uh, I don't think most people know how Velcro was invented, um, but Velcro was invented by um, a Swiss uh, physicist who was uh, walking with his dog through the mountains of the Alps. And he would notice that, you know, when he came back that his dog had all these little birds stuck to uh, its coat 
and he was like how are these things sticking so effectively so he being um an engineer he went through it and uh, um i think his name was george de mestral uh, and he basically reverse engineered the process by which those burrs stick to a dog's coat and that's how we have velcro uh, today so so that's associating looking at something that's happening and seeing how can i bring that to another realm uh, as well, you know, so that, that's a classic uh, example of that. But, you know, I think broadly speaking, there's so much that we can learn from nature if we know how to look and know how to think, because in many ways, nature is the ultimate innovator, the ultimate designer, because evolution is just a process of, you know, um, uh, improving nature's design. And so if we, there's a whole beautiful field of work called biomimicry, which is really about looking at nature as a source of solutions to the problems we face. And that's, again, a classic case uh, of associating. Yeah, yeah, biomimicry is the world of associating. We've interviewed um, a thought leader from that field. Um, so oh, associating, too, is probably a good way for people who, are, who, who do have that nagging feeling that they're not quite doing what they're uniquely yeah. built to contribute. Can you see that, that leap happening in people? You know, you, you see something out there and um, that that kind of attracts your eye that could be your your path and you take what you're doing i always tell people to first start start working in place you don't have to quit your job and join an ashram just find a way to matter where you are and exactly. learn those skills the mentoring but i think associating happens a lot mm -hmm. in um in this way that we can find our path um yep it's, find it's absolutely it's a process of seeing connections between things that don't seem to be connected. right Right. And, you know, some of the most important idea people that we come across are like that. One of the ones we talk about a lot is Damian Mander. He's a um, he was a counterinsurgency specialist in the Iraq war mm -hmm. who later discovered that single mothers make the best game wardens in Africa. Uh -huh. Yeah. Jane Goodall is on his board. He uh -huh. arguably has one of the best uh, ideas in conservation in 50 years. And, you know, that was all association. He, yeah. he went on a game drive, came came through a, on a, upon a terrible um, situation with a, a, wild, a wild wildebeest caught in a snare. And his whole brain went into, whoa, this wildlife poaching is war. Mm it was being treated a different way and he could yeah. see that it was organized crime at the top of it and yeah you know and so he brought some of that that knowledge to the the process and he's got a he's got a global um way that this can be wildlife poaching can be handled all over the world um going Absolutely. forward so i love that associating it takes a little bit don't you think of the of the six maybe that's the one that you got to make your brain get used to doing that that and reframing probably, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and I love finding the flip. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about I mean, that. There's some good stories about that. Absolutely. So finding the flip is uh, about realizing that, you know, oftentimes when we think about how we're going to solve problems, we think about technology as the, uh, the way in which we're going to do this. And um, what most people don't realize in social change is that all social change is behavioral change. It's people doing something different than they used to do before. And um, that's what's important. It's the change in behavior. It's not the technology. So finding the flip is all about understanding what is the behavior change that that technology or program or initiative or policy is going to uh, lead to, you know, and if it doesn't lead to that change, it's that technology is worthless, you know, it, it's, it's only if it leads to the change uh, underneath that um, the technology makes sense. So as we look at solutions to problems, we need to be looking at what's the underlying behavior change that that solution is going to enable. So one of the stories we talk about in the book, or a way to help people understand this, I think, was most brilliantly you know, explained to me by um, the person who made the first cell phone call in history. Um, it was a guy called Marty Cooper, who, was in, who worked at Motorola. Um, and Marty said that you know, the thing that what makes cell phones um, so powerful is that previously, when we called a landline phone, we were calling a place uh, that anybody theoretically could pick up that ringing phone. But when you call a cell phone, you're calling a person. That person does not have to be tethered to that place in order to receive that phone call. And so when uh, we were able to reach people wherever they were, um, 
uh, and not at that particular place of work or place of or home, uh, that really unleashed an explosion of creativity and productivity uh, that people didn't have to stay put at home or stay put in the office in order to be reached. And they could be doing lots of other things as well, right? So that's, and we don't normally think of cell phones as about calling a person rather than calling a place, but that's exactly what they are. Um, and, uh, and so that's an example of the kind of behavior change that is, uh, is really powerful when you think about it from an innovation standpoint. And it is, uh, it, it did set off uh, no end to the possibilities. Absolutely. Wow, I never thought about that particular mm -hmm. nuance in, in, in that technology. That's great. Um, now, finding a flip is probably going to be really helpful as we try and get through changing a behavior related to climate change, don't you think? Yeah. Absolutely. I think um, we need to change a lot of our behaviors. And um, as people try to imagine, you know, what's going to make people change their behavior if they come up with new products, uh, mm -hmm. new technologies. I think it's going to be really important not to judge the product of technology on how it's supposed to work or whether it's beautiful and all of that, but to see does it actually enable people uh, to, um, does it make it easier for people to, to live uh, life better, you know, in more climate aligned ways, let's say. I am. Um, I remember we wrote an article um, a, a, quite some time ago about a park in Denmark that was having a lot of problems with litter. Mm -hmm. And so they they gamified the trash cans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the litter problem just exactly. totally went away. Exactly. That's a great example of it. Yeah. 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 What gets you the behavior uh, change that you need? Yeah. Okay. And we can do that in our businesses. We can, uh, I feel like I, I have something in my own sphere of influence that we did that on that we had a lot of fun with. Um, uh, I'll, I'll go back to associating and tell you a funny little story, but because these are the kind of changes that we can we can that are so doable mm -hmm. um, in our dental practice. Many years ago, we started baking bread when the bread makers came out. Mm -hmm. We every single day bake bread. And so when you hit the door at our office, you don't smell that horrifying dental office smell. Ah. You you smell baked bread and it wow. and. You know, it just it just completely changes your mm -hmm. your whole mindset as you walk in the door, and you know that's just something completely left field that um, that can change the way we feel about our situations. It mm -hmm. and, and it's so small, but it's Absolutely. so powerful. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's a great thing. Okay, the last one that's going on here is called doing the best way, doing the best way of thinking. Doing is the best way of thinking, yes. Okay. So um, that's a line from a former Google engineer called Tom Chi. Um, and it's really about uh, what in the, in the design world, for instance, is called prototyping. Um, and that's that you learn a lot more when you actually get started than if you're just sitting around strategizing or thinking or um, designing, you know, it, it, it happens. Your learning comes when you try it out, when you do it, you know, so what we, what we say is like when you're coming up with a solution to a problem, it's not enough or it's not even that helpful to like put a massive blueprint in place and create, you know, a uh, hundred um, slide uh, PowerPoint to explain your idea. It's way more uh, powerful to just go ahead and try a small part, part of that. Uh, you know, what's the, the prototype, you know, that you can try out. And by doing that, you start to learn um, you know, what's working, what isn't, what's useful, what isn't. Now in the field of technology and so on, this is like, you know, second nature to most people. But I think for most of us who are, you know, just trying to figure out our day-to-day -day life, it, it, we, we tend to often uh, feel held back because we don't know what's going to happen. Well, you know, and our argument is that you'll never know what's going to happen until you do. So, um, and when you do it is when you learn what's, what's useful and what's not. Uh, so doing is the best form of thinking. Mm. And that I think is probably another um, little pearl for people to think about putting one step in front of, foot in front of the other and trying to cultivate what they're uniquely built to contribute. I'm thinking of an interview, um, my producer and I, I, my face hurt so bad after this interview with this guy, his <laughs> name is Mark Redman. Um, we have two interviews on the, good, uh, the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast with him. Mark is, I live here in Vermont, Mark is the guy who's been ch in charge of the problem of solving the problem with homeless teenagers. 
mm-hmm. for 40 years. Mm. Wow. <laughs> and he had this great, great story of, you know, he went to the, he had the right family. He had mm-hmm. the right, he went to the right schools. He got the right job at that consulting in New York city mm-hmm. after it was, he had the right apartment, you know, all the things. Yeah. And, um, and he did, he did say, well, I, I got to do something productive with mm. life, but he was working for some financial firm. So he decided to just volunteer one night a week and play basketball down at the local boys and girls club. Mm-hmm. And in that part of Manhattan, it was just yeah. terrifying, this, this particular place. And <laughs> there he did thinking he could just go down and spend one hour a week playing basketball with kids. And it turned out to be a lifetime of giving. And that guy has changed wow. the lives of so many people. It's not even, but it's taken that one first step and, mm-hmm. and doing something, you know, yeah. I, I, that's what I love about that last one. Just do something. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's- so, so for instance, if you're trying to, to switch careers, let's say, and, um, you know, move into a different field, um, I think it's really powerful to just take whatever opportunities you can to learn about that, whether it's volunteering in your spare time, whether that's, um, you know, uh, starting as an intern, whatever that may be to just, uh, or as a consultant to just start doing something to learn about this new area, this new field, so that you uh, have a better sense of what you're getting into, you know, as opposed to uh, just sitting back and, and trying to read up on it or go take a course on it, uh, you know, things like that. Those are those are useful too, don't get me wrong, but you learn quite a lot by uh, by getting started in some way. And even a small step is so lovely. We have a nice interview with a woman named Genevieve Paturo, mm-hmm. who um, now to date, her organization has given away 7 million pairs of pajamas to <laughs> children that, yeah, to children who there was this whole problem she didn't know exists um, with children who wind up um, being pulled out of, of homes for, for dreadful circumstances um, and wind up in police stations having to sleep overnight in police stations before Mm. they go into the foster care system Mm -hmm. and what happened with her was just one night she was climbing the executive ladder in new york city having a great life and she decided oh gosh my parents they did such a great job reading to us at night and she didn't have her own children so she just for some reason picked up the phone called the local police station and said do you have kids that have to stay all night in the in jail in the jail tonight and they said sure and she said can i bring some storybooks and read to them before bed and they said sure and now 11 years later that whole adventure has turned into making sure 11 the 7 million kids have had nice pajamas on that horrifying wow, wow. that's an amazing story thank yeah. you for that. yeah yeah well you know this is this is what's available to us you know mm-hmm. if we if we just pick one but you know i've I've got goosebumps here for a minute if i just pick one of these a week and just Mm -hmm. spent spent some time with that that one thing i'm sure it's like a muscle um yes it is absolutely it's it's a it's a skill you know and and the way you get better at any skill is by whether it's playing the piano or playing tennis is practice so it's it's absolutely something that you can train yourself to be good at well i tell you the whole book is full of things like this and it just reframes the way you think about possibility and your life's work. And again, um, I, I, I'm shamelessly promoting this book. I've known Rick Don and his great um, work in the world, the new reason to work, how to build a career that will change the world. And I look at that and say, that's, that's so big, but you know, you can change the world for just one person. Absolutely. And over the scope of time and generations, that can add up to a lot. It absolutely does. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast. You know, where can people connect with you? What what can they do next if they want to keep this this good train of thought going? Absolutely. So um, I would say start with the book, uh, buy the book, uh, The New Reason to Work. Uh, you can also contact me through our website, thenewreasontowork.com or through LinkedIn. Uh, I'm very active there. So uh, I would say the website, thenewreasontowork.com or through LinkedIn, uh, best way to reach me. Um, I hope you, you read the book. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, it's written to be very applicable uh, and it's written to be easy to read. So, uh, so I certainly hope you do. 
it's like a story too. It's yeah. it's back and forth. Roshan and then your part and then your um business partner Roshan and then your, it's lovely. Yeah. It's absolutely lovely. Okay. Thanks so much, Roshan. You know, for anything he and I mentioned today, any outside links or what have you, the podcasts I mentioned and anything that Roshan mentioned, you will find that in the show notes. We have a great podcast producer at Streamlined Podcast, and they will make sure that those show notes are just sparkling. And if you want to go back to any one particular point that he and I made that's in the show notes too you can just zoom right to it so um you know remember to check out the goodness exchange this is the home for goodness and hope and progress in the world we've created it to be a place where all of us can come together find each other and find a version of the future that's way more positive than the one we're seeing on the news and social media and when we come together we can change the future there together so thank you so much. Um, I hope the connections that Roshan and I shared with you today keep the goodness and the progress carrying through your whole week, and you will start finding all the joy and wonder that we've been talking about. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me. I've, re I've really enjoyed it, Dr. Linda. It was a delight. It was a delight. Have a great evening. Take care.